The subprime mortgage fiasco, however, raises significant questions about the accuracy of this picture. Since 1995, increasing numbers of asset-based securities that used American subprime mortgages as collateral were purchased in unprecedented numbers by individuals and institutional investors. These securities were in turn consolidated into what are called collateralized debt obligations and collateralized loan obligations. The risks associated with these different obligations are assessed by securities ratings agencies. It's one of their more profitable activities. The problem, however, is that many financial institutions, knowing that ratings help to determine the value of these obligations, began approaching ratings agencies some years ago to ask their advice on how to structure these obligations in order to maximize the value. But when the subprime mortgage market on which many of these obligations were built began imploding, some ratings agencies were slow to concede that something was wrong. Some ratings agencies did start putting out warning signs as early as mid-2006, yet they did not significantly downgrade their ratings of the very same investments. A common claim by some ratings agencies is that they were afraid that significant downgradings would further undermine already weakening capital markets. There's no reason not to take this claim at face value. But it may also be true that many ratings agencies, fully aware that many investors know how deeply such agencies had been involved in structuring these securities, they may have themselves become conscious that their objectivity, which is their primary asset, would be called into question. Of course, the very moment that ratings agencies were asked to become involved in structuring the assets they were supposed to be assessing, their moral antennae should have begun quivering. It's very difficult to provide objective assessment of risks associated with particular securities when you have helped to structure the very same securities. This, however, did not deter some ratings agencies from involving themselves in structuring securities based upon subprime mortgages. Now, I'm not suggesting that ratings agencies were somehow engaged in a type of sordid swindle. The point is that when ratings agencies were asked by banks to become involved in structuring securities, they should have said no. That will compromise our capacity to objectively assess the risks associated with your securities. Our objectivity is our greatest asset. It can lend value to your assets, but only if our assessments remain objective and detached. The fact that some ratings agencies did otherwise suggests, I submit, significant failures of judgment and character on their part. In terms of the virtual prudence, it reflects a major absence of the quality of foresight, in the sense that it was reasonable that any relatively clear-thinking person, especially those with enormous experience of the securities ratings business, should have recognized what was likely to eventuate from this type of activity. Now, to address these problems with securities ratings agencies, it does appear that legislatures around the world will try and introduce legislation to prevent such conflicts of interest from happening again. Once again, however, I am very skeptical this will achieve very much. In fact, it's likely to be counterproductive. What has, however, not been highlighted is the fact that markets have already disciplined securities ratings agencies, sometimes severely. The value of stock in many such agencies has plunged by more than 40%. 
This indicates that whatever might be the agency's protest to the contrary, they are going to have to work very hard to regain the market's confidence in their basic prudence and trustworthiness. Now one might think that the combination of failed interventionist policies and some rather significant moral problems that have contributed to the current crisis would have shaped the response of policymakers in ways that underscored a new skepticism about the worth of government intervention and a new emphasis upon avoiding the moral hazard problem. I am afraid, however, that this is not likely to be the case. To take one example, let us examine the approach of President Obama's new administration when it comes to the subject of addressing one of the underlying causes of the current recession, but which is now contributing to the current climate of uncertainty. And that is the turbulent American housing and mortgage market. The context is America, but the lessons are universally applicable. By now, I think most people understand that many of the toxic financial assets held by American and European banks are premised to varying degrees on a grossly inflated housing market in Europe and parts of America. The harsh reality is that until the housing market bottoms out, it is going to be very difficult to price the real market value of these financial assets. This in turn creates uncertainty about the real value of many assets held by banks, thereby leaving many banks stranded in their present state of financial limbo, unwilling to lend and unable to attract private investors in capital. As a consequence, economic growth is stalled and will remain so until the housing market recovers. Now, it follows that one of the fastest ways to allow the market price of the assets, the toxic assets, to be realized is to permit the housing market to stabilize under its own volition. There is, however, a considerable human price to be paid for this necessary process of adjust, adjustment. In some cases, it takes the form of families losing their homes through foreclosures on their mortgages. While the vast majority of these people move quickly into rented accommodations and are in fact very likely to own a house in the future, the social cost and psychological distress associated with home loss should not be trivialized. Yet other people face the daunting prospect of being stuck with mortgages worth considerably more than the property's actual current value. Now, naturally enough, there are plenty of people who want to see the governments try and alleviate the pain if not render the adjustment unnecessary. Thus, no one was surprised when President Obama announced the federal government's mortgage relief plan on February the 18th. Now, this includes using $78 billion of taxpayers' money to help approximately 5 million homeowners avoid foreclosure, losing their homes. The same plan also allows the Treasury Department to purchase $200 billion worth of preferred stock in the technically insolvent Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, thus allowing these two technically insolvent lenders to renegotiate mortgages with some of their clients facing difficulties. These measures follow in the wake of other smaller scale mortgage relief strategies implemented by the Bush administration none of which, incidentally, slowed down the foreclosure rate across the United States. Unfortunately, there is little reason to be optimistic about the probable effects of the Obama administration's interventionist approach to mortgage relief. In fact, it is most likely to be counterproductive. For one thing, it will encourage many people to stay locked, potentially for years, 
into mortgages that, financially speaking, they would be better off exiting. For some people, selling their home at a loss, or even foreclosure, would be a better alternative. Either scenario would enable many mortgage holders to extract themselves from an economically burdensome situation and begin the process of rebuilding their financial lives. Now, foreclosure will have some negative effect on a person's credit record, but so too will the fact of requesting and receiving government assistance in order to keep one's mortgage afloat. At the macro level, there's no guarantee that the envisaged intervention will stabilize the housing market. <clears throat> Something like 55% of those people who renegotiate their mortgages redefault within six months. This indicates that government-sponsored mortgage relief will merely delay the final reckoning for millions of people. It will also impede foreclosures from shifting properties from those unable to pay their debts to those who can afford to buy houses. This transfer, along with the normal process of people buying houses at market prices, is crucial for stabilizing the American housing market, thereby allowing an accurate market pricing of all those financial products that are built upon mortgage assets. And this is critical if the banking sector's current difficulties are going to be resolved in any lasting way. Now, leaving aside the economic difficulties with the Obama administration's plan, there are also serious moral problems associated with government mortgage relief efforts. Primarily, primary among these is the problem of moral hazard. Government officials including President Obama, have insisted that the mortgage relief plan will not assist those who have behaved irresponsibly. But this claim is very hard to reconcile with the details of the plan. The plan makes, for instance, eligibility for what is called mortgage modification dependent on how much borrowers owe above their house's current value. Eligibility also depends upon borrowers providing, among other things, a quote-unquote affidavit of financial hardship. And this is a sure recipe for arbitrariness on the part of those deciding who gets relief and who does not. Because defining what counts as financial hardship is a very subjective matter. It depends on factors as variable as one's income, one's responsibilities, one's family size, one's stage of life, cost of living differences, etc., etc. Even more problematic, however, is the fact that the plan avoids the issue of why some people are facing financial hardship. There is a big difference between, for example, a married couple with a good credit history and who are only experiencing mortgage payment difficulties because the main wage earner has lost his job through no fault of his own, and those individuals who freely and in many instances recklessly played the house flipping game in order to make rapid financial gains. The willingness to take high risks is rightly associated with the prospects of large gains. But the corollary injustice is that those who take high risks must also be willing to accept the possibility of heavy losses. As presently configured, the Obama administration's mortgage relief plan actively undermines this reasonable expectation. Whether we like it or not, it will send the message to many people that they do not need to face up to the consequences of being financially irresponsible. Quite rightly, those homeowners who have, who have behaved prudently and continue to meet their mortgage payments will wonder why a portion of their taxes 
is being used to shield large numbers of people who have behaved rationally from the effects of their own actions. The end result is likely to be a community-wide increase in a lack of personal responsibility. Over the long term, I think it's likely to contribute to future economic recklessness on Wall Street and Main Street, not to mention reinforce an already complacent attitude among government officials to the moral hazard problem. Now, I could say much more about the moral problems contributing to the financial crisis and which are still being ignored by most policymakers. I would, however, like to turn our attention to some reflections on the institution and practice of credit itself. In the current financial environment, much anger has been directed at those who specialize in the credit business, especially subprime lending. No doubt some predatory lending has occurred. You only need to pick up the nearest newspaper to read about elderly couples on the brink of bankruptcy because they signed mortgage agreements that they either did not understand or were never adequately explained to them. But why, some argue, should subprime lending businesses exist in the first place? Are they not financial traps for the poor and the vulnerable? Don't they discourage prudent saving? There have even been calls for official caps on interest rates offered by private lenders. Now, the difficulty, I think, with some of these critiques is that they often reflect fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of credit and its underlying moral apparatus. A revealing feature of the analyses of the borrowing and lending habits contributing to the 2008 financial crisis is that they indirectly underline the extent to which many moral philosophers and economists have forgotten that the extension and seeking of credit was a subject of considerable and often heated debate for centuries. The very morality of charging interest on loans has been intensely debated by religious and secular thinkers for over 2,000 years. <laughs> Many contemporary practitioners of finance may be surprised to know that Adam Smith actually favored usury laws. What we need to understand is that credit is about lending other people the financial means, the capital, that most of us need at some point in our life. Whether it's starting a business or buying a house, most people need capital. This means someone else, such as a bank or a private lender, has to be willing to take a risk. They stand to profit if the mortgage is paid off or the business succeeds, but they also lose if the house is foreclosed or a business goes bankrupt. Charging interest is how lenders maintain their loan's value and make a profit, the margins of which are much lower than most people realize, thereby increasing the sum total of capital available in a society. But it is also their way of calibrating risk. The higher the risk, the higher the interest rate, in order to compensate for the greater possibility of loss. It follows that if interest rate ceilings were imposed by government, as some people are suggesting, lenders would effectively be prohibited from charging interest rates commensurate to the risks involved. Hence, they would be unlikely to lend capital to entrepreneurs and businesses pursuing high-risk endeavors. Many risky, but wealth-creating and employment-generating activities would thus simply never occur. Legislating interest rate ceilings would also mean that some poor people would never have the chance to acquire the capital that they might need, for example, to go to university, let alone developing a credit rate. Entire categories of people, such as recent immigrants or the urban poor, could be condemned to life on the margins. But at an even deeper level, 
we also forget that while credit is about capital, it's ultimately about something more intangible, but nonetheless real. The word credit is derived from credere, the Latin word for believe, but also to trust. Thus, whether it's giving someone a credit card for the first time, or extending a small business the capital it needs to grow into a great enterprise, providing people with credit means that you trust and believe in them enough to take a risk on their insight, their reliability, their honesty, their prudence, their thrift, their courage, and their enterprise. In short, the moral habits without which wealth creation cannot occur. So a moment's thought about credit reminds us just how much market capitalism, so often viewed as materialistic, relies deeply upon a web of moral qualities and non-material relationships. As the credit crunch has taught us, once these relationships are corrupted, whether by basic dishonesty, excessive regulation, or political manipulation, the wheels of wealth creation splutter and eventually grind to a halt. Businesses die, people lose their jobs, and families suffer. And so to conclude, we should have no illusions. The modern case for the free market, so painstakingly developed against interventionists of all stripes since Adam Smith's time, has been set back years by the current disarray on financial markets. The same calamity, however, should remind everyone, including those who favor free markets, that loosening the political bonds imposed on economic liberty requires society's moral bonds to be constantly renewed and strengthened. In short, we are learning the hard way that virtues like prudence, temperance, thrift, promise keeping, honesty, humility, not to mention a willingness not to do to others what we wouldn't want them to do to us, these cannot be optional extras in communities that value economic freedom. If markets are going to work and appropriate limits on government power maintained, then societies require substantial reserves of moral capital. With so many people's economic well-being now partly determined by decisions of those working in financial industries, sound moral character in their employees and directors should be a premium asset sought by any bank or financial house. Virtue is, of course, a good in itself and ought to be pursued for the sake of human flourishing rather than simply a question of economic efficiency. But this does not mean that we should close our eyes to the very real economic benefits that can flow from large numbers of people embracing the virtues. That would truly be a culture-changing exercise. In this regard, it is arguable that a concern for and an attention to the virtues would mark a return to the type of political economy that was pursued during the 18th century by the modern thinkers who made such a substantial contribution to understanding how markets work, as well as the character of the commercial society that began to spread across the world in the last quarter of the 18th century. I speak, of course, of the Scottish Enlightenment. While Scots such as Adam Ferguson, Francis Hutcheson, and of course Adam Smith were committed to, and in many ways founded, the modern empirical approach to issues of political economy, the contemporary insistence on separating empirical analysis from normative inquiry and judgment is based on a distinction that the Scots would have found unintelligible. 
A similar contrast can be made with the modern tendency to judge institutions and habits solely in terms of efficiency. While the Scots certainly believe that efficiency is preferable to inefficiency, the Scots regarded utility maximization as only one of three ends that are promoted by well-functioning institutions and processes. Scottish social science also spoke of virtue and liberty, whereas ours tends to speak only of utility. They did so in part because they believed that virtue and liberty were just as real and just as discernible through reason as utility. But they also did so because the Scots believed that neither market economies nor commercially oriented societies will last if liberty and virtue, not just one, but both, are either ignored or deemed not to exist because of the rationalist refusal to regard anything as real that cannot be quantified. To provide a brief example of how this Scottish attempt, attention to morality might be seamlessly blended into economic analysis, let's briefly consider the issue of moral hazard. Today there is a great deal of literature on the economics of moral hazard. The same material, however, contains curiously little reflection on why the adjective moral is attached to the noun hazard. Indeed, when economists started studying the subject of moral hazard in the 1960s, their analysis rarely included an explicitly ethical dimension. <coughs> so why do we not simply call these situations instances of risk hazard? It may be that the word moral reflects some innate, maybe unexpressed awareness that there is something morally questionable about creating situations in which people are severely tempted to make imprudent choices. To employ a loose analogy from the realm of theology, the one who creates an occasion of sin bears some indirect responsibility for the choices of the person tempted by the situation to do something very imprudent or just plain wrong. If governments and businesses took moral hazard seriously, they would make an effort to identify those state and non-state structures, policies and practices that tempt people to take excessive risk with their own and other people's assets. They would then do what they could to minimize these instances of moral hazard. The economic price might be fewer booms, but economic growth over time would likely be steadier. The chances of mild or severe recession would also be reduced. This type of analysis, one which the Scots would have recognized as similar to their own, is surely even more essential today if we are to avoid the fatal intersection of government intervention and moral failure that I submit has contributed so much to the present financial crisis and which I fear failure on the part of policy makers to acknowledge will create similar problems in the future. Because in the end, no amount of regulation, heavy or light, can substitute for the type of character formation that is supposed to occur in families, schools, and churches. These are the institutions rather than ethics orders, business ethics courses, or commitments to corporate social responsibility, these are the institutions that Adam Smith identified as primarily responsible for helping people develop what he and the Scots called the moral sense that causes us to know when particular courses of action are imprudent or simply wrong regardless of whether we are Wall Street bankers or humble actuaries working at securities ratings agencies. At the end of his life, 
Adam Smith added an entirely new section entitled The Character of Virtue to the sixth and final edition of his theory of moral sentiments. His reasons for doing so are much to better. But perhaps Smith decided that as he glimpsed a world in which the spread of free markets was already beginning to diminish poverty, he needed to re-emphasize the importance of sound moral habits for societies that aspire to be both commercial and civilized. And this, I think, is surely advice worth heeding today. Thank you.